Good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Vandenberg. I hold the Chair of Art, Theory and Curating at Zeppelin University. And I'm responsible for the training program within Fine Art, an EU Horizon 2020 funded PhD training network. Fine Art is an acronym which stands in for uh, the future of European independent art spaces in a period of socially engaged art. Tonight, it's my honor to introduce John Roberts, Professor of Art and Aesthetics at the Faculty of Arts, Business and Social Science as at the University of Wolverhampton. And I'm extremely happy to do so because John Roberts is the initiator of, and the head of the whole fine art project. And it is very inspiring and also fun to work with him. As uh, the consortium all are all a little, um, yeah, as the consortium, we are all a little euphoric because this will be our first public event tonight. Even though we are only meeting on Zoom, we are a bit of a celebratory, um, in a celebratory mood tonight because uh, this is the moment that will open up a shared public study and thinking space. I'm even happier about the fact that John Robert has agreed to give the opening lecture to the whole project here today or tonight in this lecture series format. This lecture series will take place at a regular intervals from now on. The next talk will be that by Gregory Cholet on the 19th of March. And then the series will continue in monthly intervals with Elana Fokiaki, Fokiaki, no, Fokianaki, sorry, Cuba Sreda and Maria Lavayova. If you're interested in attending these events, please contact our project coordinator who will also post his mail in the chat. Before I briefly introduce John Roberts, I have to make a technical announcement. For data protect protection reasons, not everyone who joins the lecture can uh, take part in the subsequent discussion with camera and microphone. However, if you have not registered in advance uh, with your email address, you can take part in the discussion via just typing your questions in the chat and I'm, I will read them out then. And um, uh, those who have registered, please raise your hand. There's the symbol on the bottom of your screen. And uh, then I can see also uh, who is first and who is next. So now I would like to introduce today's speakers. It's a particular pleasure for me because John Roberts is not only one of the internationally outstanding thinkers in the field of art theory, but also one who has very important, was very important for my own thinking. I met John almost 25 years ago in 1996 when really? I was in London during the uh, European Football Championship. <laughs> um, a mutual friend, Andrew McNiven, took me to an opening uh, of the Listen Gallery, introduced me to John, and later told me about an edited volume by him, um, provocatively entitled Art Has No History which cleverly disrupted the prevailing self-images of art history at the time. Robert has already published several books and was active as a writer, curator, and critic. He received his first degree in English and art history at Middlesex Polytechnic in 1977. Later, he taught and lectured throughout the UK and overseas and completed major curatorial projects in London, Venice, Hamburg, and Liverpool. In 1998, he published the book, 
The Art of Interruption. Um, I also brought some of his books. Oh. Uh, <laughs> because now, I, now, it's, now you're embarrassing me. Yeah, it's, it's because I, I wanted some uh, physical example because this is all okay. online. <laughs> so um, um, the book, The Art of Interruption on Realism, Photography and the Everyday, a book, a book which clearly outlines his approach on historical materialism. In 2005, he obtained a PhD on the basis of previously published work with a written commentary on the work entitled The Logics of Deflation, Autonomy, Negation, and the Avant-Garde. The book of his that almost um, all of you May, may probably know, was published in 2007, the intangibilities of form, skill and de-skilling are, are in art after the ready-made. In 2011, he published uh, the book, The Necessity of Errors. In, um, and uh, in 2015, Revolutionary Time, and the avant-garde, the latter of which I feel strongly related, uh, is strongly related to the topic tonight. All of these books revolve around the aim to gain a new critical understanding of artistic autonomy, an understanding that breaks free from the bourgeois concept of autonomy and exposes the emancipatory potential of artistic practice. In so doing, Robert also emphasized that artistic autonomy and emancipation is not naturally based on subjectivity. Moreover, he argues uh, from different angles how and why the expanded field of art introduces new episteme of the social. As I said, Robert is currently not only professor of art and aesthetics at the University of Wolverhampton, leader of the research cluster Art, Philosophy and uh, Social Practice, but also the project manager of the entire uh, fine art project. And I'm delighted to hand over the virtual mic to him now. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, very much. I appreciate that. Um, as Karen was saying, um, so, uh, if if any of you are familiar with so certainly some of my later writing, there will be an, an overlap between uh, that writing and some of the themes that I explore this evening. Okay. This is called Socially Engaged Art Today. At the start of the training program for fine art, the future of European independent art spaces in a period of socially engaged art, I thought this lecture would be the perfect opportunity to produce a theoretical conspectus of socially engaged art now. This would allow, as I hope, to address a range of problems and issues that face socially engaged art today, and that in many ways reflect the critical complexities of fine art as a research training program. In doing this, we will review the social, political, and cultural formation of socially engaged art. In, but in pursuing this, I want to avoid some of the usual art theory byways and points of reference. This evening, I want to focus on two areas in particular, the relationship between socially engaged art and theater and dramaturgy, and more broadly, philosophically, the relationship between democracy, the in common and freedom. Socially engaged art in its current form has largely been with us since the mid 1990s. As post-conceptualism migrated in the early 1990s through its expansion of the installation form into a reassessment of live work or performance as an artistic research paradigm. This involved an excavation and refunctioning of the histories of performance and post-object art as the basis for a model of social interaction that valued the discursive, dialogic and conversational aspects of conceptual art reduction but place these linguistic processes at the service of social exchange and action. This model of social exchange and action 
as in Suzanne Lace's new genre, public art, focused on the collaboration with non-artistic participants as the basis for work on a particular set of social or political issues that affected a given group or community. Or community. The needs and interests of the participants would shape the content and outcome of the project. Similarly, but from a more directly functionalist position, the innovative US-based group HaHa, -Ha, as part of the exhibition Culture in Action in 1993, uh, the title of the piece was, uh, was Flood, established a hydroponic allotment to grow bacteria-free green vegetables that aids HIV sufferers. This was accompanied by educational activities and discussions on the AIDS HIV crisis. Crudely, we might say, these two forms of practice represent two key critical theoretic forms of the social turn in art since the mid 1990s. Work that seeks to learn from and with a given group of non-artistic participants in the pursuit of research into and action on a pre-given problem or question that is not determined, and this is the important bit, that is not determined by the expectations of the artist or artist involved. And work which adopts the notion of social engagement as a localized problem-solving intervention by artists in conversation with the group or community who direct the outcome of the intervention. The former essentially invokes some loose notion of direct democracy as a way of establishing a new social mandate for art. The integration of the artist, his or her, his or her materials, the site of the work, are combined into a simultaneous process of production and reception with its audience as a democratic erosion of the distinction between making and doing. And the latter, a notion of socially engaged art as a utilitarian action and form of advocacy based on alliance with a group or community. Indeed, Haha's practice set down a marker for the speculative non-art function of socially, enga socially engaged art for the next 25 years. The split between art praxis as politics and art praxis as political praxis itself. Socially engaged art becomes not so much art as collaborative practice or activist art, but a form of political activism pursued by artists. These are not the only two socially engaged form, sorry, sorry. These are not the only two socially engaged forms of note, but they do represent across their multiple adaptations and revisions by many others, what is decisive politically, formally, and culturally about the rise of socially engaged practices over the last 25 years. The abandonment of object making as a focus for aesthetic self-actualization in favor of temporary, interrogative, research-based, socially interactive, extra artistic collaborations with groups and communities that have little or no professional relationship to art. Where the artist uh, produced objects that is the focus for aesthetic judgment, even during the high, wa high water mark of the museum based installation art in the late 1980s and early 1990s, here it is relegated, if it appears at all, to one small material component of an extended field or ensemble of events, interactions and processes that privilege audience Im immersion in a fluid, extended and indeed unbounded cognitive field. In this sense, aesthetic judgment is exchanged for a shared process of learning and discursive assimilation in which the apprehension of the work in extended time for those directly involved as participants and participant viewers is never finished. Why this extensive shift in production and reception though? Why this refunctioning of the dematerialized art object well beyond the notion of art as idea? For Remarkably, socially engaged art, spatial and interactive extension of the experience of art is not confined solely to expanding the constellational form of post-conceptual installation to include live action and dialogue, as if its primary concern was to animate the installation form as performance. Rather, 
By breaking formally and politically with the dominant market nexus of contemporary practice, studio, gallery sales, as the fundamental condition of its critical challenge, it opens up art again to its modern non-art legacy, that is to social dramaturgy and to praxis, in ways that radically reorient the skills, horizons, materials, and affective attachments of the artist. Indeed, the refusal of the official modes and sites of arts production and reception provides a whole new framework of training and knowledge for the artist, external to art, artistic craft, aesthetic judgment, and the wretched approbations of collectors. But if the political shifts inside post-conceptualism during the late 1980s do not alone explain these changes. Neither does the notion that socially engaged art is merely a refunctioning of the social dynamic of the constructivism of the historic Russian avant-garde. Socially engaged um, art certainly draws on this legacy, necessarily so. But we might also say it confronts a range of problems particular to itself and as such, has had to find new resources to negotiate an unprecedented set of social and political conditions in which art and the artist have found themselves. That is, a financialized capitalism, which from the 1980s to the new millennium has destroyed the economic prospects of most artists, hyperinflated the asset status of art to a point of oppressive and comical wealth accumulation for those who so-called invest in art, and in turn has weakened the social base of artists in the interests of this general entrepreneurial production of the art object as aesthetic dry goods. In the 1990s and early millennium, the extensive refinancialization of art as an, asset, as an asset class enmeshed artists still notionally attached to the market in an anxious pursuit of gallery endorsement and approval. We might say consequently that socially engaged art is a collective and systematic resistance to the neoliberal containment of the social uses of art, or sorry, sorry, the social use values of art, and to the democratic hollowing out of culture and the public sphere. To say, therefore, that socially engaged art turns to social dramaturgy and to social practice in order to open up a new space for social use values in defiance of this hollowing out is to recognize that socially engaged art sees in social dramaturgy and social praxis a way not just of arresting the cultural claustrophobia and anxiety of the age, but of the establishment of a new or new old way of thinking about the production of art directly in relation to its audience. So when I talk about theater and dramaturgy playing its part in the social turn of contemporary art, I'm not talking about any old theater and any old dramaturgy as if art forced into a narrow aesthetic and formal corner wanted simply to meet its audience and was happy to renew its relationship to performance. On the contrary, socially engaged art in its discursive, dialogic and praxeological forms has since the mid 1990s extended and readapted what the post literary radical theater of the 1970s initiated but was unable to develop consistently as a consequence of the rapid ideological falling away and public support for new countercultural modes of theater in the 1980s. Given the generalized attack on public funding for the arts in Europe, North America and South America. That is theater, sorry, that is socially engaged art brings into focus again, the productive notion in this non-dramatic theater of art in the wide sense as a space for collective and social research in situ with others. What I've called in my previous writing on socially engaged art, a commitment to Bildung, the communities of self-learning. One theater figure that stands out in this process of re-engagement and reassessment with the new social theater and a commitment to Bildung is the dramaturge Augusta Boal who died in 2009. Boal has in fact now become one of the named precursors of socially engaged art um, in Pablo Helguera and Claire Bishop, given his focus on collective practice and non-theatrical modes of staging. In particular, his non-theatrical interventionism in visible theater 
in which anonymous actors and non-actors intervene into and destabilize a given social situation as a reflection on power and hidden injustices. Evident, for example, recently in fictional form in Lars von Trier's adaptation of Baal in his film The Idiots from 1999, the Stodelet's film Choral Performance from 2011, the lesson on this consent in which actors dressed as police disrupted the performance. Here, I am less interested in the specific details of Baal's dramaturgy than his epistemology of socialized theater more broadly and his genealogy of the crisis of theater that he developed in the 1960s and published in the theater of the oppressed in 1974. For it is in the shift that he announces in this writing that we can see why socially engaged art makes the move that it does, albeit under a very different set of conditions to the crisis of democracy and the public sphere in pre-neoliberal and colonial Brazil and Peru, out of which he developed his theater. In his 2000 introduction to the theater of the oppressed, Boal provides a brief analysis of the history of theater from the Greeks to the modern period in the form of a succession of decisive splits between illusion and actuality, actor and character, the individual and the collective. My words here are an expanded extrapolation of his arguments. Early Greek theater on stage in Delos, Athens, seventh century BCE, presented a compact version of the wild, ecstatic, ritualized fertility field dancing of processions known as the Dithyram. Performed by boys and young men, these performances became part of an urban cult of the god Dionysus, in which a chorus would dance and sing in dedication to the festive spirit of the god. This led in turn to a call and answer dialogue between the chorus and an individual singer whose visual and auditory autonomy on stage eventually became key to the transition of theater out of dance and ritual into drama and into its dominant form, tragedy. That is the emergence of a protagonist who speaks or more precisely asserts himself, always himself, asserts himself and externalizes his feelings. In the myth of Greek dramatic origins, this shift to the protagonist and dialogue was supposedly propelled into public view and acclaim by the choreographer and singer Thespis who in one recorded performance in front of the Athenian statesman Solon, who lived from uh, around 6030 to 558 BCE. And this performance uh, occurred, well, around 520 BCE. Okay. So he performed this, um, uh, he performed this um, uh, antagonism between um, the role of the antagonist and the choral, um, off script, so to speak, contradicting the chorus and expressing his own views, much to the displeasure of Solon, who saw immediately the emotive power and public influence such direct speech might have on spectators. Aristotle famously responded to this development 200 years later. That's a long time to wait for a review, but um, you know, 200 years later, by emphasizing how this tension between protagonist and chorus introduced the idea of empathia onto the stage. Instead of the singing of the chorus and the ritualized fellowship of the dancers creating a harmonious accord between the spectator and the performance, a pleasure taken from a, a drifting of consciousness, the words of the protagonist interrupted the thoughts of the spectator. The spectator now focused his attention and again, it's uh, men who attended these performances. The spectator now focused his attention on the thoughts and actions of the protagonist, attaching his emotions to those created by the actor. In other words, the focused detachment of speech from the chorus produced an emotional connection between actor and spectator that made the spectator susceptible to the influence of what was being said, even though the words were being spoken by an actor. 
Aristotle, though, was no defender of Thespis. He realized, like Solon, that a public forum, well, that as a public forum, theater, if it wasn't to give authority to those without the right of authority, needed to attach its newly found freedom in speech to the exemplary lives and travails of those who best know the meaning of freedom and the value of speech, the aristocracy. Questioning, limiting, challenging, and harnessing this power of direct speech and unauthorized advocacy therefore has been central to the conflicts over the public function of the theater from its early modern inception to the early 20th century. For state, local authorities, offices of the law, financial backers, the release of the protagonist from the chorus or dominant ideology had to find some recognizable and negotiable way back into the space of the chorus, so to speak, and social stability. The play should not spill its discontent into the world. Shakespeare's theater contained the spirited voices of the rabble, but it was not and could never be a theater of the rabble. John, Gay, John Gay's Beggar's Opera from 1728 was an unprecedented satire on Georgian corruption and a sympathetic account of the criminal demi-monde, but disenchantment and the escape from poverty were in the end for Gay and other playwrights of the period best served if possible by a good marriage. Theatre was the place for the merry clash of low and high and the luck of the heroes or heroines daring do. In Henrik Ibsen's late Enlightenment Theatre of Reason, the detachment of women's speech from that of men, invariably their husbands, is accompanied by women's humiliation. In Hedda Gabler, 1891, for example, Hedda's resistance to the tyranny of a bad marriage and domestic oppression turns into a tragic submission to avoidable shame. But for Bertolt Brecht, the first systematic critic of the long history of theatre's Aristotelian deference to tragedy or the comedic reconciliation of men and women to their fate, however cheerful making do as the way of the world, the struggle for unauthorized speech should not be left to a com comfortable complicity between the play's author and the conservative expectations of the audience. Indeed, the charm of the emotional bond between the actor and the audience that Aristotle thought so powerful and therefore in need of responsible direction should be broken, stripped out, changing passive sympathy and tears for a sense of active involvement in the issues presented by the play. And the best way for the author and actors to achieve this is to step back from the collusion between acting and characterization. That is, the actor should disabuse the audience of their solemn and melancholy investment in the would-be theatrical integrity of the performances on stage. By stepping out of character, singing songs, introducing asides, changing voice, switching parts without investment in one particular character. As Ball says, and I quote, the actor is no longer hidden behind the mask. The mask of ancient, that is the, the mask of ancient Greek theater. He emerges and reveals himself beside it, openly contradicts and enters into conflict with it. What Thespis has done with the chorus, Brecht now, Brecht now did with the protagonist through the Verfrom dungs. End of quote. Fate, the transformation of the failure of politics into tragic enclosure the pacification of the audience as wistful sympathizers. The fictive self-sufficiency of the play were breached. But for Ball, Brecht failed to take the next step, the dismantling of the fourth wall and the upending of the dominance of the actors and playwrights control over the audience itself. For in the end, for Ball, Brecht defended his privileges as poet and his role as a conduit of creative truth failing to release the collaborative potential of the audience into the theatrical experience. Thus, what the politics of the theatre needed was not just the dismantling of characterization as the bearer of truth, sole bearer of truth, I would say, and the construction of the spectator as a spectacle interrog interrogator of words, things, and persons, 
but the liberation of the audience. And I quote again from Bob, should actors and characters go on dominating the stage as their domain? Well, I sit in the audience. I think not. I think we should go much further. We need to invade. The audience mustn't just liberate its critical conscience, but its body too. It needs to invade the stage and transform the images that are shown there." End of quote. The spect actor, the spectator obviously, the spect actor, as Bohr calls this liberated spectator, this liberated spectator, is given thereby unprecedented responsibilities and agency. He or she enters the theatrical space, not just as a potential co-producer, but as a social protagonist in alliance with the actors, author, or dramaturge, affecting both how and what the theatrical experience incorporates and encompasses, and the social reach of theater beyond its bourgeois centers of power, influence, and competence. For indeed, what Boal means specifically here by the spect actor is someone who has no professional understanding of or involvement in culture, who comes to theater as excluded from its authority, and therefore has everything to gain by their involvement. This incorporation of the culturally excluded defines crucially what Boyle was to designate as the three models of a popular protagonist theater. Simultaneous dramaturgy, and I quote, the spectators write and simultaneously, sorry, the spectators write simultaneously with the acting of the actors. Two, image theater, and I quote, the spectators intervene directly speaking through images made with the actors' bodies, end of quote. And three, forum theater, I quote again, the spectators intervene directly in the dramatic action and act, end of quote. The spectators are still guided by the dramaturge and actors, but under the proviso that they can change anything in the text and presentation, and as such, are able to shape the outcome of the production through taking on the responsibility of co-creator. Indeed, the spect actors write and rewrite the text, which the actors then perform. And in some instances, the spect actors take on the responsibility of acting themselves. This model of collaboration had a profound influence on a post-literary theater in the late 1960s and 70s, pushing theater into the enviable position of a privileged form within the counterculture, insofar as its new actionist, collaborative and pedagogic identity enabled it of all artistic forms to appear to come closest to what Aristotle designated as the most important of all the arts, politics. Politics is the sovereign art for Aristotle pre precisely because it is able to incorporate both the major and minor arts and sciences into its broader theoretical engagement with power, thus enabling politics to reflect critically on all the fields of action of the arts and sciences. However, the political privileging of post-literary collaborative theater of the 1970s developed a very different understanding of theater's relationship to the idea of political sovereignty. Theater intersects with the sovereignty of politics, not because theater presents us with a focused framework to assess the consequences of individual actions, conflict, and passion of commitments, but rather because it provides a space of shared learning in which actors, authors, and audience are able, through a process of collaboration, to create a politics or a vision of politics that is projective and transformative, directly aligning what is seen and felt and conceptualized by, by, spect by spectators and actors alike on stage with the possibility of political action outside of the place of performance. The sovereignty of politics in the new theatre lay therefore in theatre's capacity for something greater than the representation of the drama and conflicts of politics and political advocacy. Sovereignty lay in the active control of the production by those involved in various political struggles over the creative process, enabling their subaltern and non-professional voices to shape the character and form of the performance. 
Moving beyond Brecht's critique of Aristotelian drama, this Bollian dramaturgy then produces a new sense of political sovereignty in theater, a space of intersubjective and intersubjective experimentation in which the intersection of many unauthorized voices transforms given expectations, identities and relations as a living and urgent reflection on the future forms of the political. In short, Bollian theater's radical Aristotelian de-Aristotelianism becomes an experimental and open-ended space for new forms of democratic speech, challenging, deconstructing and reversing the means by which the experimental forms of politics in theater are invariably closed off by what we might call traditional literary theater's management of hubris. In as much as in traditional literary theater, the cost of the radical protagonist transgression of boundaries has to be reassimilated into the greater rationality and order of external authority if political reason and democracy are to be restored. Indeed, the political sovereignty of this conservative theater is the political sovereignty of the unillusioned and is no stranger to the left as it is to liberals and the right. It is no surprise, consequently, that socially engaged art in the mid 1990s emerges from this history. For this history offers the visual arts, given the chronic fetishization of the art object under financial capitalism in the 1980s, a renewed space for its own long standing engagement with the extension of form into participatory practice. But if this reconnection with participation and collaboration allowed art to reconnect with debates on the theater and art in the expanded field, the shift of socially engaged art was not a dialogue with theater as such. What socially engaged art takes from Boyle is not expressly the crisis of theater as a bourgeois public form, but the crisis of the relationship between artistic production and its audience as a result of the market's repression of the meaning and reach of art within a narrow range of social use values. And consequently, if art is to find a space beyond these constraints, it has to divert its energies into forms that bypass the nexus of studio gallery sales, where the repression of art's social use values is secured and maintained. Hence, it is mistaken to assume, as some advocates of socially engaged art do themselves, that socially engaged art is principally a renewed manifestation of art links to political activism. In a trivial sense, this is true. Socially engaged arts participatory forms establish a mandate for arts involvement in political change. But like Ball's theater, it is also in its most ambitious forms, an experimental intersubjective space in which making and doing are conditioned by the inter interdeterminacies and contingencies of group learning across skill sets that defines in the end a very different understanding of making and doing in art. One in short, that is first and foremost, not conditioned by the authority of those who exercise cultural power. Um, sorry, in one in short, that is first and foremost, not conditioned by the authority of those who exercise cultural power over those who have little or no access to such cultural power. As such, through its broader commitment to self-learning, Bildung, as I've said, socially engaged arts philosophical concerns are far deeper and wide ranging than the renewed commitment to an activist politics in art, which in a sense has always been with us. This is because socially engaged art operates on an additional front to the question of direct political action. That is, it operates precisely through its substantive connection to questions of autonomy and freedom. If socially engaged art functions within a Bollian and post-Brechtian field of action, it does so also attached to, late, to art's late modern critique of the notion of artistic subjectivity as the fount of free will and free expression. Collaboration and participation, in other words, are not simply a functional widening of the field of arts political action, but a deepening of the late modern critique of the association of freedom with individual self-actualization and self-expression. That art in particular, under the bourgeois nexus of studio gallery sales, has since the middle of the 19th century secured for itself. 
Indeed, the thought of freedom in and through art historically has been overwhelmingly subordinated under capitalist democracy to an ontology of subjectivity and continues to play its conservative part in these terms in the widespread reaction to socially engaged art as bureaucratic and instrumental. But if freedom is not a thing ascribable to the power of appearing to oneself as the sovereign subject of one's own action, then appearing to oneself as an artist, as the sovereign subject of one's own artistic self-actualization is no less problematic. As Jean-Luc Nancy argues in The Experience of Freedom, first published in French in 1988, and I quote, it is no longer a question of winning or defending the freedom of man or human freedoms, as if these were goods that one could secure as possessions or property, and who essential virtue would be to allow human beings to be what they are. Instead, this is a question of offering human beings a freedom, or a moment, uh, this is my interjection here, or a moment of liberation, which still has to be freed. So a moment of liberation, which still has to be freed. In this sense, the attachment of freedom, end of quote, in the sense, the attachment of freedom to the sovereign self-actualization of the self through art can only deny the unnamed possibility and potentiality of freedom, given that freedom is the unforeseeable and ongoing encounter between the self and others. Freedom is a specific encounter of the self with itself outside of itself. And as such, it's always in a state of inst instauration, uh, renewal or inauguration as the basis of its encounter with the world. I quote Nancy again. Freedom is properly the mode of the discrete and in, 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 insistent existence of others in my existence, as originally for my existence, but at the same time is also the mode of the other existence insisting in my identity and constituting or deconstituting it as this identity. End of quote. In other words, if freedom is constituted in fine art form through both relation and the critique of relation, that is the disidentification of the self from relation, freedom is formed neither from the resources of the self nor from those of the institutional and judicial in common alone, in common, yeah. in common alone. That is, if singularity is in and of itself a plural derived from the in common, nevertheless, the in common is not thereby the means by which freedom for all is secured. For singularity can only reside in the renewed commitment to test or challenge the in common in the name of a justice of the singular plural not circumscribed by the prevailing idea of the in common. The in common then is anterior to the self, but not as a first condition. It is rather that shared space from out of which the singular plural emerges to secure the making and renewal of the in common as a free community of the incommensurable. Accordingly, the in common is not an internal rule or stable measure of community or an external unity or regulative ideal imposed on singularity but the emergent space in which the free incommensurability of singularities is experienced by all as being in common. Now, this ideal, and I, it's very much an ideal in Nancy's writing, so this ideal understanding of freedom as a free community of incommensurable singularities has defined the ambitions of a range of work that has been produced under the name of socially engaged art since the beginning of the millennium, even if Nancy is rarely singled out as a theoretical ally of Boer. This is because there is a sense in which socially engaged art, philosophically at least, provides not just the space for the integration of art into community, but an unprecedented reflection on the capitalist limits of the in common, and as such, the ways in which neoliberalism or mature capitalism deprives us of our capacity to, de to design the life we want. And this requires, in the spirit of Nancy and Boa, 
if we are to establish a clearer sense of the political in socially engaged art, to move beyond the commonplace notion of socially engaged art as community building. To see what properly defines socially engaged arts, historical shift beyond the nexus of studio gallery sales, namely the development of Bildung as a series of experiments in the dismantling and reconstruction of democracy itself. And such unauthorized speech in these terms becomes the collaborative, discursive, and dialogic material of the contingent making and remaking of the relationship between freedom and direct democracy. One of the platitudes of the late Cold War and early neoliberalism was that there can be no democracy without capitalism. Market justice balances social justice insofar as market justice is a fairer mechanism for the distribution of values. Today, financial capitalism, constrained by the vicious circle of growing technological competitiveness, the increasing expulsion of living labor from the system and reduced investment opportunities in production, sees democracy and the discretionary interference of politics on the free operations of the market as essentially coercive and intrusive. In fact, one of the political functions of neoliberalism has been to protect market justice from social justice. On the grounds that social justice is illicitly normative, whereas market justice is held to be rational and neutral. Hence, in a world in which social justice is considered from the perspective of the performance of markets to create moral hazards for capital, Financialization has successfully strengthened the notion that the only true evaluation of your standing as a citizen is your performance as an employee. It is no surprise, therefore, that financialization has hollowed out people's relationship to an understanding of democracy. For the monetization of an increasing number of transactions and relations has further weakened the scope of social justice to affect people's participation and faith in social transformation. In fact, financialization politically is increasing, increasingly micro intrusive. As financial markets grow and expand into formerly non market sectors and services, these multiple forms of financial extraction extend the predatory disposition of financial rationalization to everyone. Thus, the sovereignty of politics and the sovereignty of theatre as a political space are united in socially engaged art. It is nevertheless socially engaged art's privileged relationship to the philosophical critique of the subject through the critique of authorship that lifts the experimental form of socially engaged art, critique of democracy beyond the political in art as direct action. This is why, although socially engaged art clearly encompasses and refunctions political activism and community building through art, it's the making and remaking of the intersubjective and intersubjective space of practice that overall represents what is distinctive about the constructive and crit critical potentiality of socially engaged art in the long run. This demonstrates above all else, a residual and powerful commitment to the question of autonomy in art, even if socially engaged art is operating at the very edges of the experience of art uh, as political praxis, and as such at the edge of autonomy. In other words, defending the sovereignty of politics in art requires at the same time, acknowledging the limits of the political in art, as the very condition of art as a thinking of and a thinking with singularity politically. Thus subsumed, thus subsumed under the mandate of experimentation in socially engaged art is the same problem that boils post-Brechtian dissociation between art praxis and art as social praxis was confronted with as the anti-colonial context of his participatory theater um, was swept away by state repression in the late 1970s. If the ideal state of theater is action, why not pursue action alone? Why art as action? As Boyle says, and I quote, the practice of these theatrical forms creates a sort of uneasy sense of incompleteness that seeks fulfillment through real actions, end of quote. 
This is why in Bohr's later writing, he talked of theatrical experimentation as a process of rehearsal, a trying out of alternate forms, implying that the possibility of action and the new relationships established um, uh, establish theatrically is in the end linked principally to the future and those who will follow. This subjunctive understanding of the political form of theater, the production, that is the production of a state of affairs that has not yet occurred, is in fact what sustains the necessary fictive conditions of art praxis as political praxis in socially engaged art. In contradistinction to the assumption that in order for art praxis and socially engaged art to do their jobs properly, they have to become political praxis. Interestingly, even someone as committed to art political praxis as political praxis as Oliver Marshall insists on the importance of the subjunctive. In his co Conflictual Aesthetics, Artistic Activism and the Public Sphere, published in 2019, he talks of the, and I quote, difficult problem of how art can relate to political activism and as such defends the need for socially engaged art to re-temporalize itself as a pre-enactment of the future. Artistic pre-enactment critically extrapolates from contemporary political realities to, and I quote, an image of our social or political future. End of quote. An additional quote. Art practices in an entirely experimental way may therefore pre-enact political ones, even though they will never be fully identified, they will never be fully identical with political practices because they would cease to be art. However, if we wish to increase the chances of artistic practice in the moment of future conflict, artists would be well advised not to imprison themselves within the spontaneous ideology of the art field." End of quote. But for Marshall, pre-enactment is not a rehearsal of or for the future in Boas' sense. Because art political praxis cannot predict the conditions and reality of any future event, which are obviously indeterminate, the artwork as pre-enactment cannot therefore act as a guide to the future in any specific sense. Yet nevertheless, he calls for pre-enactment as a kind of practical intervention in which artistic experimentation functions as, and I quote, training sessions that provide us with the necessary skills necessary to engage in the real thing, end of quote. A training for the future, if you like. Which is an odd way to resolve the question of experimentation and political praxis in art, and uh, how art can relate to the problems of political activism. Practical political skills, imaginary resources and critical concept are developed from within the realm of art, which in a sense returns the problem to its beginnings. Art, political praxis and political praxis are reconnected and realigned, but now from within the sphere of art itself. So again, we are faced with the same question. Why art as art political praxis and not just straightforwardly politics as political praxis. To produce a range of political skills and strategies from within art seems politically impractical. All the same, what martial art appears to be arguing, which I agree with, is that socially engaged art, socially engaged art that produces intersubjective and intersubjective experiments on the crisis of politics and democracy, needs to operate in the here and now as opposed to collapsing the fictive and imaginary resources of art into the utopic. The subjunctive is futural, connected to the imaginary, certainly, but it is not utopian. That is, it remains as art in the domain of practical struggle and everyday problem solving. To summarize then, so I'm coming to the end of the, of the talk now. The key issue that faces socially engaged art in the present period is how to address the sovereignty of politics and the sovereignty of politics in post brechtian theatre and dramaturgy from within this gap in art and theatre between art political praxis and political praxis. In other words, the gap between art praxis as political praxis and political praxis as such 
is neither something that can be ignored in the hope that art, not praxis, will prevail, nor prematurely closed down in the name of art's direct political efficacy and the exit from art. Indeed, the gap between art political praxis and political practice is where art, in fact, produces its social autonomy. That is, where it produces the active space in which the self and other, singularity and the in common free themselves, under the name of experimentation, from determinate identities and reified outcomes. In this sense, art, subjunctive and futurial resources actually opens up a space for real politics external to art, but without assuming that what art does in this case has no real transformative relationship to the political. On the contrary, art produces its critical and imaginary resources, you know, non-dominative non -dominative modes of relation, attention and self-affection, directly from its socially limited field of operation. Thus, by closing the gap between art political praxis and political praxis, art political praxis, in a reverse of the conventional expectation, in fact, loses its connection to reality, insofar as the active convergence of art with what passes the everyday and political reason loses its capacity for critical distance, and as such, weakens its subjective, sorry, weakens its subjunctive and imaginary link to the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was a really brilliant introduction into the theme and also um, a way of widen our horizon uh, to go from uh, antiquity or Greece over um, the John Gay Brecht, uh, Brecht and John de Nancy. Uh, yeah, and Augusto Ball. Um, that was really impressive and also um, gives us um, a different view on what we can uh, call socially engaged art today. I have uh, one uh, technical announcement to, to make before we start our. Uh, discussion. Um, I have to say that we're recording this event. Yeah? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I just have to mention that we record, we're recording this event so that everyone, everyone who um, talks and uh, writes is uh, just aware that we do so. Um, I actually, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. That's this hand symbol. You, I think you're all familiar with uh, Zoom. And those who are not uh, within the um, video and uh, audio uh, room, they can simply write uh, questions into the chat and I will read them out then. Um, but since I can't see a question now, I maybe would start with one. Um, a very practical one. Um, I also have a lot of uh, theoretical questions, but a very practical one. I was wondering if you know something about who these spect actors in uh, Bowles Theatre were. Well, they, uh, um, not in any great deal, but they, 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 re they range from um, out of work actors, uh, uh, peasants, workers, and anybody who is willing to participate in the, in the group activity. Okay. Um, yeah, one, and another thing that is maybe more a theoretical question, I really appreciate that you don't distinct your own thoughts strongly to other theorists. And I find it very convincing how you have shown the potential of the cooperative uh, theater and performance as a process of rehearsal okay, for you're, you're, social transformation. You're breaking uh, up slowly. Could, could you repeat the last bit, please? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I find it convincing 
um, how you argue and how you have shown the potential of uh, cooperative theater and performance as a process of rehearsal for social transformation. This approach, um, be, but then seems very different from what Rancière's concept of the emancipated spectator is like, or how he argues. Yeah, yes, which, yeah, is, uh, yes, which, yeah. is, deep, which is deeply problematic. I mean, yeah, given, yeah. Its, given its uh, quasi-autonomy. Yeah. From, and, from, the, uh, from the kind of structures of reception uh, um, that, that I'm talking about based upon group learning and building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. would you say then that sticks to an ontology of subjectivity that actually has to be overcome or would you distinguish your position from this in another way? No, I mean, I mean uh, the subject... <laughs> As, as with all philosophical problems in relation to questions of, of, of subjectivity, uh, the answer um, is dialectical, and um, I'm with you see I'm with John Nancy on this. I mean, Nancy is not um, uh, he's, he's neither a, a defender of subjectivity nor a defender of the um, the absolute cr uh, critique of of the, of the subject. For him, quite rightly, subjectivity is uh, is plural and socialized. So in this sense, he 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 partly draws his arguments uh, in the experience of freedom from Marx's early writings, where Marx um, argues, argues for a similar position. But through the, for the concept of the ego rather than the self, because philosophically the concept of the self didn't didn't exist in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've applied, in a sense, I've applied, I've applied that to the form of, of, so, of socially engaged art. That is, socially engaged art is, is philosophically significant, and it's philosophically significant because of the way that it seeks to, to get away from, from these uh, corrupted uh, binaries between the self and the collective. Um, even the self and, and, and other. In fact, we might say that socially engaged art um, is, a, is a form of trans-individuation in which socialized singularities clash with other socialized singularities in order to speculate on or produce um, possible new singularities and new forms of the in common and, and community. So now uh, there are coming some questions. Um, the first one is from Angela. How could we define the relationship between theater and the visual arts today, as opposed to earlier moments in the history of the avant-garde? Well, to be honest, I mean, it seemed, it seemed as if I was um, particularly critical of literary um, theatre. I'm not, I'm not critical of literary theatre at all. In fact, interestingly, Boal, although he spends uh, most of his career uh, attacking literary theatre, says that, that radical theatre from, from a broad perspective should use all resources. However, these resources have to be, um, in a sense, Explain, explain to the audience or produced in such a way as to establish a distance between their, their received form and the, the uses that they are put to by, uh, by new dramaturges and actors and, and so forth. So I am, I'm with Ball on that. I'm not uh, criticizing literary theater at all. However, literary theater today is, is is pretty dire because of the way that it sets itself against politics in a transformative in a transformative way. For instance, the um, the if you like the, the glories of 1970s and 1980s uh, British political theatre. Think of Carol Churchill, um, David Edgar, Edward Bond. Very few those playwrights from the 70s and 80s, and most of them are still alive, um, 
Well, they rarely get their plays um, put on in the West End in, in London or, any, or, or anywhere in the, in the UK. And certainly none of their plays from the 70s and 80s are, are ever um, um, revived. Yet there's still a great deal of scope for that kind of literary based uh, politi political theater. However, to get back to the, uh, the first part of, your, of, of Angela's question, it has to be said that new theater or post-literary new theater has learned an enormous amount from the visual arts. We might say that new theater, certainly in Europe, is a, is a, is a post-visual arts theater. So there are, there are all kinds of hybridizations and exchanges and so forth. But of course, the majority of that kind of theatre is still uh, performed in, in theatres. And of course, um, the majority of socially engaged art necessarily, otherwise it'd be completely embarrassing, um, is performed in various um, social contexts and outside of the realm of the theatrical itself. But, it just, but this does not... Um, um, take us away from the point I make repeatedly in my lecture around the sovereignty of politics. What, um, what Aristotle was doing in respect of his defense of the sovereignty of politics when he comes to write about uh, emerging, emerging theater was to say that theater above all other social artistic forms at that particular time, secured the sovereignty of politics. But given his own politics, there are severe limits to this concept of sovereignty. Hence the fetishization of both comedy, well, comedy as a reconciliation of, um, of opposites and tragedy as a, as a reconciliation of the protagonist or hero with his, with his fate. Okay, thank you. Um, Alexandra do Carmo um, has a question and thanks for your presentation. I have a question in relation to artistic autonomy. Can you talk about in which sense is artistic autonomy dependent? Um, of course, of course, autonomy. Autonomy is a dependent category. I mean, it's it's, it's unfortunate that, that philosophically, autonomy has uh, has been handed down to us through a notion of separation. When I talk of autonomy, I'm not talking about separation. I'm talking about autonomy in a socialized sense, in the way that both um, uh, the early Marx and and particularly Adorno talk about autonomy in relation to in relation to the arts certainly uh, in, in Adorno's aesthetic theory. So autonomy is always relational. However, it's not, uh, art is not simply um, relational. It, it, and it's not simply relational because of its relationship to political economy. Now, I, I spent a huge amount of time and uh, an effort over the last, I think it's almost like 10 years now, actually since, the, well, longer than that, since the publication of the tangibilities of form. Thinking through this question of autonomy in art in relation to the commodity form. Artworks are dependent commodities, but they're not solely dependent commodities because at a fundamental level, they are an in incomplete commodity because they cannot be subject to the, the value form. That is, they cannot be subject to socialized production. So art always escapes the conditions of socialized production and the commodity form, given that um, the production of art is not produced to a given template, to a set, to a set, um, uh, set, set of orders. And therefore, in the form of um, um, the reproduction of the commodity, and it's through it's it's through the the relative um, escape of art from the commodity form that we can talk about um, um, autonomy. But you might well then say, well, given that, 
um, why not return to standard forms of, um, of asceticism in art? If the, if the art object is not completely subsumable under the art commodity. Well, um, for Adorno, and I do follow Adorno on this question, um, given that autonomy is a socialized relation, this socialized relation changes. So art's relationship is not simply to um, the commodity form. It's also, its, rela its relationships are also based on um, art's connection to the world, the world of experience and other artworks. Um, art in its socialized condition, therefore, is a, is a process of um, external and internal um, negation. This is why when we talk about socially engaged art, we don't simply talk about um, is art political forms as um, fixed or categorical. Uh, socially engaged art in and of itself is, is transitive, unstable, subject to imminent critique, bypassed and crossed through with, 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 with all kinds of uh, artistic and extra artistic forces. And this is why theater is an interesting example to take when we come to look at the, um, um, the development of socially engaged art over the last 25 years. Forms of theater practice have had a huge impact either consciously or unconsciously on the social form or the autonomized um, social form of socially engaged art. And it's had this um, impact through the realization that um, that art still has a relationship to the fictive. That is, it has a relationship to the imaginary. It has a relationship to um, distanciation from, um, from empirical uh, experience. Okay, uh, thank you for this. The there are several questions now. Um, Michael Chorus um, comes from a more practical angle. The making of the space of practice. How can this be done through the means of a project that is a temporary time constrained engagement between artists and participants? Wouldn't that recommend a permanent artist in residence or are artists like teachers creating a new sense of identification among the heterogeneity of participants? Yeah, this is a this is a um, important and interesting question. This is this is not this is an issue that socially engaged art in all its broad forms has not solved. In in a way, um, we might say that it's um, impossible to solve on an, on any broad basis because, of course. Um, the, the ideal participant or protagonist in a socially engaged uh, artwork is the, um, the immersed and involved spectator. That is somebody who can participate, who, who does, in fact, participate in the work, transforming the outcome of the work. Now, very few people are in a position to do that. Well, very few people are, are, are invited uh, to participate in the production of a socially engaged work of art in that way. But, um, but also, even if an invite goes out to someone to participate in a socially engaged um, artwork in, in that way, the commitment is enormous. And so we have, I think we have a, um, a split between those who are engaged directly in the work and those who are who experience the work on an occasional um, in an occasional way and at a distance as participant ex uh, as participant spectators and i don't i don't know how um, 
socially engaged, um, the forms of socially engaged art can get can get around this, unless, as Michael says, um, the form of, of socially engaged art is long-standing and involves a transitioning public and those who are involved directly uh, in the works production and, and reception. But of course, the, <laughs> the costs of such a project are, are, are astronomical. And one of the things, in the light of everything that I've just been saying, one of the things that faces socially engaged art today are the e economic conditions under which um, it operates. Maybe two years ago, there was a great deal of public support for various kinds of socially engaged art. Today, given COVID and, uh, and, um, and, and other problems, um, these forms of participation and collaboration are being looked at more, um, more skeptically. So the future, I mean, the immediate future of socially engaged art um, perhaps is not as good as we hoped, Two or three years ago, but that doesn't that doesn't alter the the critical and philosophical determinants of socially engaged art. Um, we are in, in some sense we're we're lumbered with this un ungainly concept of socially engaged art. But socially engaged art, outside of this uh, uh, ugly category, or Category that has become um, ugly is, is is precisely this space of building, of communities of self learning, and these and these communities of self learning can can take all kinds of forms, can take all kinds of turns, can do all kinds of things, giving cha giving uh, changes in uh, uh, political and, and cultural circumstances. So, if today some of the classic forms of socially engaged art that relied on you know, public funding and um, extensive public involvement are no longer possible in the same kind of way. This does not mean that, that these, these forms have, have been superseded or that new forms of socially engaged art will transform themselves into into forms of social engagement that we have no, you know, presently we have no conception of. Hence my um, singing out of this uh, concept, this linguistic concept of the subjunctive, that is um, a, work, a, a, work, a working towards the unexpected. Okay, thank you. Um, I have several uh, questions and um, none of our colleagues are among them. That's quite strange. Um, okay, the next one is from uh, Greg Cholet. He says, hi, John. Thank you. This is intense and provocative for this intense and provocative talk. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on how your idea of avant-garde revolutionary time relates to this description today about the encounter socially engaged art makes with what is in common even if this is experienced as a sort of temporary freedom zone tfz yeah um yeah this is a uh, thanks greg for the question um this involves us in another discussion or a related discussion. Uh, one of the, I mean, this touches on the question of, of socialized autonomy. I mean, one of the, the key issues around socially engaged art over the last 20, 25 years is the question of socially engaged art as a enclave space or a space that works um, athwart or besides or against um, you know, official official spaces and fair to say I think there's there's some there's some truth in this 
I mean, what socially engaged art does as a, as a build on form is allow a group of disparate individuals, some professional, some non-professional, to establish a set of working relations that provide the conditions for all kinds of experimental practice and thought. In some sense, uh, this has now become a kind of classic definition of the, of the, the social space of, of, of socially engaged art. Now, um, in relation to the question of the, of, of the avant-garde, this, <laughs> this was never a, an avant-garde question, certainly for, this, uh, for the historic avant-garde. Um, Rochenko and El Lizitsky never talked about enclave spaces. It would have been idiotic. Um, um, nevertheless, um, there is um, an issue to be answered around the question of the, the temporal nature of the socially engaged art space and the avant-garde. Insofar as my reading of the avant-garde insists on the idea of the avant-garde in a broad sense as a research program, not as a collection, you know, an unfolding collection of styles. Now, in some sense, this is precisely what socially engaged art does. It breaks with the tyranny of style. Now, I know some um, faint-hearted supporters of socially engaged art and some enemies of socially engaged art talk about socially engaged art as a, as, a, as a new style. It's not that at all, rather. It's a re-engagement with the question of um, temporalization in art as a break with um, crude forms of historicism and chronology. And in this sense, um, I really don't see socially engaged art as coming after post-conceptualism, even though it draws on um, various tropes and moves and strategies in post-conceptualism. I see it rather in the way that I view um, Soviet constructivism in the 1920s under the mantle of the avant-garde. What's interesting about constructivism in the Soviet Union in the 1920s is that it produces a new, a new synoptic account of um, a, a wide range of practices. In a way, it, it touches on or replicates some of the things I was talking about in relation to, to, to Nancy and the uh, and singularity and, and the in common. It produces a whole range of singularities through the in common in order to transform our understanding of the in common. Now, as I said, this is precisely what socially engaged art does. It establishes a space for the production of singularities that then, and then thereby transforms our notion of the in common. So I think that's the best way of answering that. The next question is from Blake Stimmons. Uh, Stimmel. Stimson. Hi, John. Stimson, yeah, Stimson, yeah. sorry, yeah. Hi, John, terrific talk. Thank you. I particularly appreciate your extraction of the subjunctive form uh, from the utopian. I'm wondering what would you make of the January 6th insurrection and similar incidents as socially engaged art? <laughs> I don't okay. so much mean to pro uh, be provocative <laughs> with this as technical, that is, how would you distinguish left and right manifestations of Bildung or social dramaturgy yeah, uh, that course. seek to bypass established social, cultural, political, and economic gatekeepers? In other words, to what extent could we say, with Chapello and Boltanski, for example, that the countercultural idiom brought into new focus in the heavy new left uh, 1960s has been appropriated by a new economic of and political spirit on the right? So that was a very long question. Yeah, so, it's a, again a very a very good question. And, and many, I mean, many of the uh, traditions, genealogies, and um, 
the concepts that I was working with in my paper are, 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 are utterly marginal and considered um, and redundant. Um, in the light, in the light of that, now to go back to the the earlier part of your of your question, I mean this is something that uh, Alain Badiou has, has, has addressed extensively over the last twenty years. Um, what constitutes a true or authentic and uh, radical form of bildung, um, and what constitutes an inauthentic, um, reactionary or aggressive form of of, of bildung, because. Um, uh, um, shared forms of learning, of course, are not. Um, are not possessions of the left or or liberals, um, and in a way, yes, you're right. If you, this is the position you're arguing, the attack on the sixth of of January was a was a, wor a weird and florid and um, um, form of building in in action. But um, even so, utterly utterly regressive. So. I would say then that progressive forms of building are based or predicated upon the capacity of those who are involved in this process of learning, reflecting back on um, the process of learning in order to change, correct what they've learned in the light of um, knowledges that come to them externally. And <laughs> we might say that none of that applies to the 6th of January attack in Washington. So my concept, of, my concept of Bildung would then um, over, I and mean, I've talked about this before in various of my books, would overlap um, with the notion of, um, of a scientific research program. But in a weak sense, um, Bildung in art is, is not about uh, um, formulating models of deduction and uh, induction. Well, only in a loose sense, anyway. Ned Hughes asked, could you comment on how you think socially engaged art has been affected by authority politics? Thinking about the UK context, many organizers have emerged receiving funding from national bodies such as Arts Council England to create socially engaged collaborative art that responds to the crisis created by authority. authority. Uh, would you say that authority uh, has created a market for socially engaged art? See this. Is, see this is this is the this is the cynical view. This is a this is a. I mean, I, I'm opposed to this. Um, this is the view that's adopted by um, those who see socially engaged art as um, so, solely as a bureaucratic form. It's not. It's not a bureaucratic form. Um, it can become bureaucratic, but then again, the standard forms of um, Exhibition display are completely bureaucratic. Um, the fact that you're, you're a group of artists and non-artists um, working together in order to um, uh, establish a project that needs public funding does not mean thereby that you're um, engaged in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bureaucratic exercise. Anyway, um, the sorry, the other part of the question was, um, oh, yeah, yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk about. None, 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 uh, we've had no questions so far about the question of democracy. I think um, it's what I was trying to draw out in the talk was this intimate uh, relationship between socially engaged art and um, the limits of neoliberal democracy or, and, and the critique of democracy. And some of what I, um, I touched on, I draw from uh, Wolfgang Strieck's um, interesting book, Buying Time, certainly this distinction between market justice and, and social justice. I mean, what distinguishes um, socially engaged or broadly around these questions of you know, um, enclave practice, um, building, group learning, and so forth, is this visible stretching of the meaning of democracy 
in a world in which we're all invited to see ourselves as employees rather rather than um, rather than as activists and citizens and you can't you can't discount this when you come to um, understand and assess the broader forms of social engagement so those who talk about social engagement in art as a bureaucratic form attached unbelikely to funding bodies in the state are, are mistaken. Yeah. Okay, just a technical question, uh, John. Are we limited in terms of time? Because it's already five minutes past eight now. Um, do you know? You, I'm, I'm happy to go on. If everyone wants to go on, okay. I'll be glad okay. to continue. Okay, because I have uh, some questions left. Uh, one is from Theo. Prodomides, and he asked, can art move beyond the transformative experience of education between the I and the we? How can we radically imagine trans-individuation trans in art? And is it actually what we need right now? Well, we are, I mean, th this is, again, this is the, the, the point that early Marx makes and that uh, Nancy makes extensively in Experience of Freedom. We are, we, we are, and Hegel, of course, I mean, and Marx derives uh, all his thinking on this question from Hegel. We are um, um, constantly transformed by this relationship between I and we, given that the I um, is we, and that our experience of the we uh, is an experience of um, um, the self um, emerging necessarily from the in, from from the in common. So art 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 participates in that. But historically, and this is the point I made right at the beginning of the talk. Um, historically, because of um, um, well, for a number of reasons, fetishizing the self under, under capitalism, but also the fetishizing of, of, of the self as autonomous in Western um, philosophical tradition, it becomes impossible to think the I and, and, and we and the we as I in, in, any, in any concrete way. So all art participates in that. What socially engaged art does is um, draw attention to that self-consciously self-consciously uh, as a as a form of, of direct uh, participation and collaboration and this is why uh, it's um, it's its forms are so affecting mm -hmm. the next question is from uh, david branca leone i hope i pronounce it right um adorno's aesthetic theory yes but adorno was only willing to contemplate autonomy in terms of music and dada. So uh, surely an extreme position and there must be better philosophical reference points than Adorno. Um, well, I, I disagree. Um, yeah, well, actually Adorno was very dismissive of dada um, because of its um, use of heterogeneous uh, elements. You're right about music though. He did see questions of, uh, of autonomy straightforwardly um, productive uh, in relation to music. Um, but the, uh, it's easy to misread Adorno and many people do, but there are many people who don't misread Adorno. And I think um, I'm one of those people. Um, <laughs> um, the, question of Ador the question of autonomy in Adorno is related to this question of art socialization. Uh, um, art can only um, emerge through um, its escape from the heteronymous conditions into, uh, under which it, um, it finds itself. But he, but the rider to this is he can't escape from heteronomy into aestheticization, into the aesthetic art object, because that in itself is another form of heteronomy. So given that, Adorno, has, there's still a lot of mileage in uh, his significance and importance, the questions around um, the self, the collective, the singularity, and the in common in relation to socially engaged art. You're muted. Yeah, sorry. The next question comes from Marie Rosenkranz, and I would suggest that she can ask uh, her quest <laughs> questions 
um, without me reading it because she has access to the mic. Okay. Marie, Marie could you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to read it because otherwise it gets longer. <laughs> um, let me find it. Well, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, is a special relationship to the fictive enough for art action to be more than just action? Um, or is there maybe more that distinguishes art activism from normal activism? And a little bit more provocative, why is it even important uh, to always declare this difference? Because I'm also uh, doing it and I completely agree with the attempt, um, but it, is also something I ask myself, uh, why, yeah, why do we do it? Okay, look, um, okay, thank you for that. That's a very um, um, important question. Um, and I, I, in a sense, I dealt with this question in, in the talk um, when I talked a little bit um, about Oliver Marshart's um, work and his confrontation of, of this problem between what I call art political praxis and political praxis. Now, if art political praxis wants to be political praxis in the terms that you've just outlined, then why doesn't it, be, why doesn't it become political praxis? Now, the reason it doesn't become political praxis, certainly in, 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 in many uh, testing uh, uh, cultural and social situations, is that certain privileges accrue to art that protect the artist and activists who are engaged in art political praxis from the state even from jail, um, um, from all other kinds of, of, of abuse. If you're, if you're engaged in art political praxis, that is if you're engaged in an art um, political project, certainly that's supported by various art funding uh, agencies, you're gonna be left alone. You're gonna be left alone to do your, um, your art political work. If you don't have those um, 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 protected resources, you're gonna be far more vulnerable Particularly if you're if, if you're working in situations where um, real politics intrudes violently. Now the question of fictive, you're, you, uh, the fictive, you're absolutely right. I, I'm not. Um, I don't. I'm not holding out a torch to the fictive in and of it in and of itself. The fictive and the imagine, uh, imaginary will not alone sustain these forms of engagement and participation. Of course, this is why, um, certainly in relation to socially engaged art, the long legacy of non-art, the extra artistic, that which does not fall under conventional forms of artistic expression and so forth, are, absol are absolutely in, 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 in important. Um, they, not just important, they, def they define the boundaries of what, um, socially engaged art, art can be. But um, as soon as you step into that realm, um, as soon as you then begin to tackle questions of, of mediation um, through the art project, your commitment to art makes your commitment to politics inevitably a philosophic, a philosophical reflection or a philosophical commitment rather, rather than simply a political commitment. So. Thank you. Alexei uh, Pensin has a question as well, and he can also speak. Uh -huh. Could you unmute yourself? Perfect. You're still muted. I'm sorry, yes. Uh, yes, I'm just decided to entertain you a little bit with a human face in this uh, gathering dedicated to socially engaged art, <laughs> not <laughs> <a> sociality, <laughs> etc. Uh, given that this happens in this sort of, we are captured into these technologies and uh, exactly as the opposite of this spontaneity, singularity, etc., which usually has drawn was saying in his uh, remarkable talk. Uh, so my question was about this philosophical aspect of theater, because I was somehow 
uh, being impressed by this uh, dramatic turn of John himself of his interest to theater in last years because we as colleagues, we had some conversations about this. So I was trying to identify philosophically what besides sort of creative things, which John also somehow involved with, with respect to theater, uh, was behind this. So I was thinking about uh, your reading uh, of theater as a kind of a form of production, producing this sort of space uh, for singularities uh, for those uh, kind of uh, uh, which uh, uh, somehow avoid uh, identification, right? So in the sense that they avoid being assigned a specific identity, which is now very kind of politically urgent because these class or racial identities, they are still, still here and somehow still kind of exercise some political pressure. Or, or gender, race, etc. All these identities. So, as far as I understand, I just wanted to clarify your argu philosophical argument about theater. So, you are drawing on this uh, account by Jean-Luc Nancy that somehow present this as a kind of inter-individual or inter-singular space between those um, those um, singularities who try to kind of avoid those identifications which usually present in real social world which is full of oppression uh, reality itself is a form of your assignment or to some as you said to employment to a kind of position identity etc so theater somehow cre create this uh, kind of uh, subjunctive space of this sort of uh, uh, this sort of uh, space where all this identification could be suspended temporary, as far as I understand from what you've been saying in your paper. So my question was also, and I'm a little bit skeptical about your reference to Nancy, because I think this moment of 90s where these books were created, like Nancy, other book about community, uh, 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 operative community yeah, yeah. Yes, an operative community is somehow also draws on this idea of pre-floating singularities which are not captured into this sort of identification mechanism, etc. That's, that's, not, that's not his argument, but anyway, go on. Yeah. No, I think it was uh, his argument was against essentialist understanding of community, against uh, kind of uh, non-operative or inoperative community, which is not producing work or kind of object for consumption, etc. Uh, thanks for reminding me this. Uh, no, but I mean that in general, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical about Nancy in this respect because uh, this position was very typical and that's why it was also influential in uh, the 90s, exactly at this formative moment of uh, what uh, was later called socially engaged art or relational aesthetics. But, uh, and, and this was a lot of much in artistic practice, this sort of philosophical ideas about singularities, about non-working collectives, they are just meeting to share their sociality, et cetera, it's for free exchange without kind of specific purpose or commodity to produce. But at the same time, I saw that this is now, uh, for me, this paradigm seems a little bit uh, kind of, not obsolete, but still, I mean, it's in, as an utopia or specific kind of utopian space, it's still working. But I mean, uh, politically and philosophically, I'm not sure that this sort of uh, vision of this community of free floating singularities can work today politically. So I thought maybe to read your um, philosophical that's, aesthetic that's, model of, uh, no, uh, sorry, that's just- post, That's the post-structuralist reading of Nancy. I don't, I don't read uh, Nancy as a post-structuralist, but any, yeah, anyway, go on. No, no, I just mean that uh, maybe it's also because some of your previous interlocutors in this uh, meeting was mentioning this term, uh, trans individual, et cetera. So I thought that maybe another interesting reference, I mean, for your research, for your thinking about this, uh, just not a critique, but rather uh, the suggestion would be uh, rather subsuming this idea of theater as a sort of philosophical and aesthetic model for art. To uh, the Alex, of... I, could you could you sum up your question a little bit? Uh, yeah, it's like a comment rather. So, I, I, what do you think about this idea about uh, individuation and trans individual again? Because it was in one of your previous questions. Because I think it's interesting because we could look at theater as a machine of 
specific individuation process, like this relation between chorus and the hero. So this how, uh, and also according to Marx, how this in individuation happens uh, from these pre-individual anonymous kind of shared social background. But I think it might be just a suggestion for you to think in these terms and also to, to face the danger of theater because since Nietzsche who introduced this topic of theater and individuation, uh, theater has this sort of dangerous side which can lead to complete kind, kind of bacchanalia and <laughs> orgy <laughs> which somehow disperse uh, our uh, kind of our... Well, this, this is the theme in, in my yeah. paper. The, um, the conventional um, Greek-oriented um, history of the emergence, emergence of theatre um, is, is based on the, the, emerg the emergence of the protagonist of singularity from, from the chorus. And most of the radical um, work done on theatre in the wake of that philosophically and include Boal and that is a is a is a is a critique of that. Mm. However, what's interesting about Boal is that he doesn't he doesn't um, concede um, as much to the in common as a critique of singularity as Brecht does. This is why his theatre, in pushing beyond the fourth wall, is concerned with a post-Brechtian theatre that is involved, is predicated um, upon the idea of the singular as trans individual. I'm so sorry to have to um, just put in now, and um, unfortunately we are out of time for um, today's event. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry to hear that, but um, I, I could go on all day, I think. But <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say the same thing that we have to wrap up, and therefore my suggestion would be that I uh, maybe put two questions in one, and then you can answer it, and then we say, all say goodbye. Okay. Uh, one is by James Bettany, and he asked if socially engaged art itself could be said to be concerned with the social or with the individual being um, personally addressed, could socially engaged art inform ecological or post-human thought? And then uh, Angela, uh, Angela's question is, um, I, I really just take out uh, one part of it. Are we in the realm of collaboration when the police are attacking all of us engaged also in activism and protests in the streets? Well, um, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> um, in, in reply to, to James, to be honest, I, I think um, questions around um, the post-human singularity will be um, extraordinarily significant for all kinds of, of work over the next uh, 20 in 20 or 30 years. That's my prediction for the evening. And what Angela says, um, no, we're, no, we won't, we won't be, we won't, we won't be participating in the socially engaged artwork. Okay. Um, since uh, we shouldn't be unpolite to the event team of the University of uh, Wolverhampton, who is waiting for um, their, yeah, um go to go home <laughs> um and um i'm very very thankful uh, john and i got a lot of very positive comments to uh, how you answered the question so congrats to that as well and um yeah i'm sorry for all the others who uh, um still have some questions uh, and and brought in some questions maybe we can 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 we record the questions um, that would be a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, this was intense and a very good start for fine art and our lecture series. And again, I would like to invite all of you to Greg's uh, lecture, which will take um, place on the 19th of um, March. 
I think it's actually, no, it's a little bit earlier. I think it's um, seven o'clock. Um, ah, look it up at the website. Um, um, but it's the, on the 19th of uh, March and uh, I'm very much forward to continue the talks and I hope that you all will join us next time again. Uh, thank you so much for all the participants and all the uh, questions and the discussion. And thank you, John, for this really tremendous talk. Thank you, everybody.